right, looks like we are live. It is Saturday morning, August the 1st. And probably not going to be too many people joining me today because some of you are at work. Well, look, uh, color me Sophie B all the way from the UK. Hey, girl, how are you? So glad to see you. Um, let's see, who else is here? Love you too, honey. Stacy Newman, how are you? Great, great. Thank you, everybody, for jumping on board. Happy Saturday to you. Um, some of you are working. Uh, some of us <laughs> are shut down. And so uh, who would have thought? Working but always find time for you. Bless your heart. Thank you for that. Um, who would have thought that we would end up in this situation again? But in any case, we are dealing with it the best that we can. Um, today, I wanted to... Uh, spend a couple of minutes online and, and talk about great coverage because even though it sounds basic and it sounds very fundamental, uh, there's still a lot of people that, that, that misunderstand a little bit about it. So today in this uh, little quick spot here, I want to just kind of give you some ideas to think about. Okay, so, so first of all, you know, we always use, you know that I'm a word person. So for me, a lot of times there's a lot of words we use in this business that really you're not describing what we're actually doing. For example, the word coverage. Um, think about, you know, when we speak to people and we use words, what we do is we actually send them mental pictures. So if I say to someone, I want to get coverage, their mental picture more than likely is a picture of something covering something else, you know, and sort of like painting a wall in your house. When we color hair, that's not what we're doing at all. We're really not covering anything. We're actually merging, meaning that we are adding a chemical to another chemical structure, and they then become one color. Um, some of the rules you often hear as people will say to you in a one-step color process, always remember that your underlying pigment or undertone or whatever you call it will always make up 50% of your finished result. So what that means is that you're not really covering it up, even though we call it undertone or underlying pigment, so that we kind of like we uncover something. We're not doing that. We're simply lightening the hair. And then whatever, lo whatever level we're able to achieve in lightness, then whatever pigments in that color, those two are merging together and they're creating that finished color result. So that's why I think sometimes we must understand coverage when we talk about gray hair. It also comes down to your own perspective. You know, what do you call coverage? Do you call coverage where you see no reflect in your finished color, where it is completely opaque? Opaque means that it's absorbing light. It's not really reflecting much light at all. Is that what you call gray coverage? Or do you call gray coverage uh, something where you you're actually you're coloring the gray and you do you you accept certain amounts or certain levels of reflect that's important to understand because you need to kind of identify what your target is that you're trying to achieve and so when we work with gray hair a couple of things to always remember number one gray hair traditionally resistant gray hair will have many more cuticle layers than normally pigmented hair what does that mean? Now, average head of hair has, average hair strand has seven to 10 layers of pigment. Gray hair can have upwards to 14 to 16 layers based upon how resistant that it is. So even when you're using a double N or a triple N to cover your gray, cover is a word we use, it's our language, you may not end up with satisfactory coverage in your opinion. So we have to ask ourselves, when I'm working on gray hair, it requires a little bit different approach to working with the hair. I think sometimes we misjudge gray hair because we think, well, because it's gray, then there's no pigment, therefore it's easier to color it because there's no pigment in there. Remember that pigment is part of the structure of the hair. So the hair still has structure. Virgin gray hair is still good virgin hair. It just has no coloration in it. So when I go to color that hair, I have to keep in mind that I'm still addressing it just like I would a pigmented head of hair, but there's going to be no additional pigment added to my finished result. So that's why when I try to cover gray successfully or to create 
as opaque a finish as possible, I always keep that in mind. And I keep in mind that gray is one part blue, one part red, and one part yellow. And so I'm always going to use a formulation that has some degree of gold in it because when I add gold to my gray, I'm going to get a browning out effect, which is going to give me a natural base color to work over. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining. I'm on a, a little talk here about gray hair. So first of all, ask yourself, how much coverage are you trying to achieve? Or what kind of a finish are you trying to achieve? Opaque or translucent? Ask yourself, if it's resistant gray hair, am I manipulating it properly to achieve the right result? Here are some of the, the behaviors that people are using and they're wondering why they're not having success. For example, uh, some people teach use 30 volume for better coverage over gray. I don't teach that. And there's a simple reason why. The volume of developer, the higher the volume, the more pigment it disturbs in the hair. That's true. But it also simultaneously disturbs pigment in your artificial color. So the minute you mix peroxide with your hair color, dyes begin to develop. Peroxide starts fracturing and breaking down. You know, that's what it does. And it starts degrading some of the pigment in your color in the bowl before you ever get it on the head. So the more pigment I disturb, the less opacity I will have in my finished result, which sometimes can mean that if I use 30 volume, because someone said that gives you better great coverage, my finish is gonna be more translucent simply because I disturbed more artificial, I degraded more artificial pigment than I did using a standard 20 volume. Conversely, people who say they get better coverage over gray hair with 10 volume, you have to have an adequate amount of oxygen release in order to get successful dye development. The lower the volume of developer, the less oxygen release you have. So if I'm using a five volume or a 10 volume, I have much less oxygen release, therefore, I may not get maximum dye development using those two colors. I'll get dye development, but I won't get maximum dye development. When I use 20 volume, which all colors are tested within the laboratory, I now should get adequate, adequate oxygen release and adequate dye development. So the 30 volume story, <coughs> the reason I don't teach that is because here's a test you can do on your own get yourself well actually you don't even need hair but you could get hair if you wish uh, or you could take cotton to my you know the way i do my dye outs and you could mix your level five let's call it a level five mix it with 20 volume 10 volume and 30 volume and let it just let it oxidize you're going to find that your 30 volume section is going to look lighter than your 20 or your 10. why is that because it's a level five. Why does that happen? Because 30 volume is degrading more of the pigment in your color. So that's my tip for you on 30 volume for great coverage. Second, um, how light can a color be and still give us adequate coverage of gray? Well, we know that in the laboratory, the rule of thumb is, in order to get complete coverage of gray, that's the way we describe it. So that means maximum deposit on gray hair. You must be a level eight. That's a level eight. That's a, a light blonde or darker. You will not get successful coverage, maximum coverage with a level nine or a level 10. And here's why. The amount of pigment in a level eight when they quantify it, is about 10 units. You need 10 units to get complete coverage. A level 9 is about 8 units, and a level 10, based upon the tonality that you use, could be anywhere from 3 to 5. So there's not enough pigment in a level 9 and a level 10 in order to give you adequate, adequate deposit or adequate dye development, enough pigment in order to cover that gray. You say, well, I use a 9 and 10 when I work with blonde hair. That's true. But when you work with blonde hair, it's double processed hair. So you have bleached it. Now you've broken down the structure of the hair. So once you break down the structure of the hair, 
it's much easier for a level 9 and a level 10 to be used on the hair and get some sort of what we would call coverage. But remember, gray hair itself is healthy hair. It's just no pigment because of tyrosine and catalase. So <clears throat> that's why we recommend eight levels, eight level or darker. Now, there are people, uh, you know, as a trainer, it's really hard for me because um, I, I'll have people call me and they'll say, well, I went into a salon and I showed them this new product and um, they said, you know, why can't I use a 9 and 10 to cover gray with that product? And we said, well, we don't recommend it because the same story I just told you. And they said, well, my other color did that. You know, that, that rebut of my other color did that all the time. Um, I'm not saying that you're lying, but what I'm saying is there's some variables. It's really hard if you can't see the visual to really know what variables were included in order to do that. Here's why I say this. If I take a level 10 natural and put it on 100% gray out of hair, it will develop, but you'll never see it because there's not enough pigment in the level 10. If I take a level 10 gold and apply it to gray hair, what I'm doing is I'm applying gold to gray and I am creating a browning out effect. You will see it. Not a lot, but you will see a faint hint of tonality in that gray hair. Why is that? Because you added the gold to the gray with naturals. You didn't have any gold that you were working with. If you do a 10 level ash, it's even worse than that. It does develop the dyes, but you can't see them with your eyes. So when we work with gray hair, we have to keep some things in mind that number one, it's a different animal. So I always say there's three steps. Number one, clarify, a client has gray hair. Well, I never had to do that before. I always put color on dirty hair. Good for you. You can probably get color on dirty hair anytime, but you're asking me for the most successful results. The most successful results is clarify the hair. And I always say clarify the hair no matter what you're doing. Every time you color a head of hair, you should clarify it. Okay, so that's number one rule. Number two, find sections. When I'm working on my gray hair, I take fine, paper-thin sections, eighth of an inch. Can't you know? You should be able to read newsprint underneath it. The finer the section, the better the deposit. The finer the section, the more lift. If you are using a light blonde on a medium brown, light brown head of hair, and you take very paper-thin sections, and then in another portion of the head you take quarter-inch sections. That portion where you took the finest sections will give you a much lighter visual result <laughs> because it just, it gives you less hair to work on and you're going to get a better lift and you'll also get better deposit. So step one is clarify, step two, find sections, and step three, and this is the key. Step three, you go to the area where the hair was most gray, where you're most concerned about. And at, when your timer goes off, check it. If the color has slipped for any reason, whether you didn't clarify or whatever the case, don't take the product off the head. Mix up the same mixture that you were using, only a fresh batch, and apply it right over what's on the head. When you do that, that hair is already pre-softened because it's had a color setting on it for 30 to 40 minutes, and it's going to accept the color much easier. And that will prevent you from having those areas that have a tendency to slip around the front of the hairline or in the back of the hairline because you miss them. Those things are very, very important. If you follow those three steps alone, it'll make a huge difference. Now, there's one other thing that you can do if you choose, and that is to manipulate the fiber prior to doing the color service, meaning I'm going to do a pre-softening. Pre-softening means that you are making the hair um, more accepting to the color you're about to apply to it. So if I have a head of hair, gray hair resistant, that has a lot of layers of cuticle, I need those cuticle layers to kind of separate so I can get my color to penetrate into the cortex. So I'm going to pre-soften with color straight from the tube. And I'm going to apply it to where the most resistant areas are. The rule of thumb is two levels lighter and warm. 
So, so never less than two levels lighter and warm because you do not want to have extra pigment when you do your final application and cause your color to look too deep or to look too dark. Once you've applied that to the hair, then mix up your regular formulation and then apply it right over the top of what's on the head. You do not have to worry about it. It is not going to affect your finished result and it's gonna help the, color accept, the hair accept color. Can I still pre-soften first with a lighter G straight from the tube? Yes, you can, absolutely. So pre-softening that way. The final thing is to shift your formula. And you can shift your formula by simply reversing the developer and color ratio. My favorite ratio is three to two. Three parts of color to two parts of developer. What that does, two things. Number one, it raises the alkalinity of the solution, of the mixture. And number two, it increases the amount of pigment that you're working with. So anytime I want to see, even if it's a translucent brand of color, I want it to be more opaque looking, I simply reverse the ratio. I'll use three to two, even on a level nine blonde, and I'll get more pigment, I'll get more deposit. So, so those are the things you can do when you're working with gray hair. You know, it's funny that I think that sometimes we don't stop and think about what we're doing and we have to own the information about gray hair and, and gray hair, no, no manufacturer owns gray hair. <laughs> it's just a fact of nature. Uh, and so we can deal with it to set it up for success. I think sometimes we become in a hurry and we don't take those little bit of extra steps. And uh, for me, I would rather take the, ex the extra steps to begin with so I don't have to go back and try to adjust it. And the reason for that is because I believe as a colorist, my credibility is on the line. If I say I can achieve that goal, I should be able to do that. All right, so look, gray hair shouldn't get the best of you. It should be easy for you to work over if you follow those steps. And um, it works with the things I shared with you work with any brand of hair color that you're using, any permanent hair color that you're using. Those, those behaviors are not exclusive to one brand or another. And <clears throat> remember, gray hair is gray hair on all human beings. It's pretty much the same stuff. Now there is gray hair that we can cover with demi-permanent colors, and we're happy with that. That's more soft gray. It reacts more like tented hair. But for those resistant gray heads that throw us a surprise and you know who they are, you know, this will help you have more success. I wish you guys great success. Thank you for letting me share this with you today. Uh, I hope you all are doing well and uh, great. So it looks like everybody's good. Have a great Saturday from my heart to yours. I'm Captain Color. I'm out. I'll see you all soon. All my best to you.